Today we're going to answer some of your questions and I'm also going to share with you four inspirational quotes from Richard Branson. Are you interested in property investing, success or money? Well, you're in the right place. This is the Michael Yardney Podcast, where each week you'll learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment and money in 20 minutes or less. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect and pass on your wealth through strategic property advice. Now he's your host, Michael Yardney, who has once again been voted Australia's leading property investment advisor. That's the fourth time he's won a similar award in the last six years. Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. Today, I've handed over the show to you where I'm going to answer your common questions. I've received so many questions, but I've tried to pick three that seem to resonate with lots of people. The first one is about how to acquire multiple properties in today's tighter lending environment. The next question has to do a bit with timing the market or time in the market, what's more important. And the last question I'm going to discuss is the pros and cons of cash flow, positive properties versus capital growth properties. And in my mindset moment, I'm going to share with you four quotes from Richard Branson that inspired me, so I hope they inspire you. So let's get on with the show. The first question I'd like to answer today comes from Ram from the Promenade in Mount Pleasant, Western Australia. Ram asks, when it comes to property investment for growth, is timing in and timing out or time in the market going to give me a better return on equity? Ram, I guess what you're asking is how important is timing? And I first thought it was very important when I started investing, but I've totally changed my attitude. I guess it comes down to that quote that was attributed to Warren Buffett who said, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. And many investors interpret this as the best thing to do is buy at the bottom of the market when others are fearful and sell at the top when others are greedy. But in my mind, that's not always the best property investment strategy. Well, first of all, I don't think you should be selling. So therefore, timing isn't as relevant if you're a long-term investor. And I frequently meet investors who've missed out on great opportunities because they're so consumed to try and find the right time in the market, they actually forgot to take a plunge and buy something. Now, I don't know your circumstances, Ram, but you're in Western Australia where the market has been flat, well, actually falling for a while. It's starting to flatten out a bit and you're possibly wondering, is it the right time to get in? Now, I think Western Australia and Perth's got a bit more hardship before it starts to pick up. And while you were waiting for that, there were great opportunities in Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra, Brisbane. Isn't that interesting? So timing isn't important for successful investors because there's no perfect time. Property investments dogged by dozens of different variables. And although I know there are some spruikers who are going to tell you it's a more exact science and trying to hotspot it and get the next property wave, there's no perfect time to invest. And in fact, there's no perfect property to buy. That said, there are some principles that you can apply whenever you're going to consider investing in real estate to make sure that you're not exposing yourself and you're more likely to make the most of the property markets. So what is going to push up property prices if it isn't timing? And it really has to do with buying an investment grade property. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about there, please go to episode one of the Michael Yardney podcast where I go through it. And in fact, in episode two, I spend a bit of time talking a bit about, is it too late in the property cycle? So I discuss this in quite some detail there. But in short, three things push up property values. People, in other words, household formation, how many of us there are, purchasing power. And I'm not actually talking about cheaper, affordable properties. We want to buy properties in areas where people have got more purchasing power because they've got higher disposable income. And then the supply and demand, which is a more short-term thing, which is really how many properties there are. So as I've said often in this podcast, about 80% of the performance of your property is going to be affected by the location and about 20% by the property in the location. So I use a top-down approach to choose the right location and then I use my six-stranded approach to find the right property. I've discussed it before, but quickly, the top-down approach is starting with 
the state, which is the state that's going to do particularly well or the location that's going to do well? It's capital cities because that's where the action is. That's where people are going to have better jobs, more jobs, higher paying jobs. That's where the migration is. And the majority of that's happening currently on the east coast of Australia. Two thirds of the migration, which is growing 55% of our population growth, two thirds of us in Melbourne and Sydney. And if you then include Queensland or basically Brisbane, there's only about 12% of the population growth from migration going to the rest of Australia. And most of the jobs are being created in Melbourne and Sydney. So you stick to the big capital cities, you stick to where jobs are. Then within those capital cities, you look for locations where the demographics of the people are such that they've got higher disposable income. The latest census data gives us all that. So we choose those suburbs. Then within those suburbs, we choose the right streets, the right locations. Look, you know, in your own suburb, there's going to be areas that perform better than others, more leafy streets, more tree-lined streets, more livable streets. Then we choose the right property in that location and then price. Actually, I didn't say anything about timing, did I? Because timing really isn't that important. And then we choose the right property, we choose an investment-grade property. Go back to episode one and I'll explain all that to you. So when's the right time to buy? Ram, when you're ready, when your finances are ready. So the top and the bottom of the market, the peak and the trough, really is only one day. And despite all the information and all the research available, the researchers can't get it right. The experts can't get it right. So therefore, don't try too hard to time it. Now, sure, you make your money when you buy your property, but you don't make it because you buy it cheaply or at the right time. You make your money when you buy the property by buying the right property, one that's going to outperform the averages. So I'm not that worried about about timing. And by doing that, it means by being a long-term investor, I'm not that fussed with all the white noise, all the nonsense that's in the media about what's going to happen. Because what I do and what I recommend you do, Ram, is when you've got the funds to buy a property, you investigate the right property in the right market in Australia at the time and take advantage of it. Now, sure, to some degree, timing is important. You don't want to buy right at the peak of the boom and then wait a couple of years for your property to go up in value again. But there's an old saying, when was the best time to buy a property? That was 20 years ago. When was the second best time today? In other words, Ram, buy when you can afford to buy and when you're ready to buy. The next question I want to discuss is from Charmaine Fu from Surrey Hills in New South Wales, thanks for sending in your question. And like everybody whose question is read on air, I'm going to gift you a book. It'll be coming in the mail. And your question is, what strategies can one use to acquire multiple properties in the current market in the new lending environment? Charmaine, you're right. It's actually much harder to buy multiple properties currently, but you're still getting the same things you're in your inbox as I am, I bet. You know, you come along to my course and you can buy seven properties in seven minutes or you can buy 10 properties in 10 years. And you know what? It doesn't matter. I'd rather own one Westfield shopping centre than 50 secondary properties. So it doesn't matter how many properties you've got. It's more important about the size of your asset base and also how well your properties perform. So I'd rather you own one investment grade property than multiple secondary properties. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't be building a substantial property portfolio. The trouble is that's going to take time. Now I know you're going to read on the magazines, see on the covers of these people who bought 10 properties and how they're doing well, but at Metropole and our offices in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane, we come across a lot of beginning investors and many experienced investors and we frequently see people who have used some of these, what I'd say, not too good strategies to buy multiple properties in their portfolio, often secondary properties, often cash flow positive properties, and they come and ask us for help because they're stuck. Their properties haven't gone up much in value. They may have had enough cash flow to service their debts, but they've missed out the huge capital growth in the big markets of Australia because they've bought in secondary locations. And then they ask us to unravel what's going on, and interestingly, they're finding real difficulty selling their secondary properties. Now, I'm again not suggesting you shouldn't try and build a substantial property portfolio, but you may have heard me say, Charmaine, that it takes the average property investor 30 years to become financially independent. Now, I'm sorry, that's probably not what you want to hear, Charmaine, but the answer is it often takes people 8 or 10 years, the first stage of their property investment career, 
to learn what not to do. They buy the wrong properties, they buy secondary properties, they buy in the wrong locations and they find they've got to unravel that and that takes five or seven years. And then they need two good property cycles to grow a substantial property portfolio. Now, of course, you can shortcut this by having the right mentors, by having the right people on your team and by buying only buying investment-grade properties. If you're not sure what I mean about investment-grade properties, as I've already said with the previous question, go back to previous episodes of this podcast. But property investment is lumpy. What tends to happen is you can buy one property and then you can't buy another one for a while until your property increases in value and you've got equity for your next deposit and until you save some money or the rent goes up or you've got another way of showing serviceability. Now, Sure, you may say, well, I'll buy a cash flow positive property instead. It'll give me a bit more cash flow to show serviceability. No, it won't, because you'll never get this next deposit with cash flow positive properties that don't grow in value enough. And the, I don't know, five, ten dollars a week positive cash flow you're going to get isn't going to be enough to satisfy the banks. So property investments lumpy, as I started to say. You'd buy one property and then you won't buy one for a couple of years. Then you'll buy another one. Then you may not buy another for two or three or four years. And then you may end up buying two. So my suggestion is find a strategy, and you've already talked about high growth properties, so stick to a high growth property strategy and buy properties when you're ready. In fact, I've just answered when to buy properties in the previous question when Ram asked his question about timing the market. So yes, it is difficult to buy properties currently, Charmaine. We are going through a credit squeeze. The banks are making it tougher and people with multiple properties are having more difficulty getting finance because of the new serviceability criteria. This means we're not going to have a property crash because the market is slowing in an orderly fashion and in due course this shall pass and the banks want to lend money and they're going to eventually restart lending eat more easily again i've been through these cycles four or five times the good times are ahead this too shall pass stick to your strategy thanks for your question charmaine If you're looking to get started in property or to grow your existing portfolio, turn to someone you can trust for independent advice. The team at Metropole Property Strategists have been involved in over $2 billion worth of property transactions, creating wealth for their clients, and they can do the same for you. They don't sell property, so their advice is independent and unbiased. Metropole can devise a strategy, their buyer's agents will buy your property for you, or you could use their renovations team property development or portfolio management services. Arrange a time for an obligation-free chat at metropole.com.au. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. If you've been regularly listening to my podcast, you know that each week I like to spend a bit of time talking about the psychology of success in my mindset moment, about why the rich keep getting richer, the habits of the rich people, why some people do better in all elements of their life, because the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. And I love sharing quotes from successful people because it helps you get into their headspace. Today, I'd like to share four quotes from Richard Branson. And the first one is, Don't be embarrassed by your failures. Learn from them and start again. Now, that's a really good lesson because if you treat failures as a lesson, a lesson on how to approach your goal or or to do anything, then you use the learning to improve your chances of success when you try again. So failure is only the end if you decide to stop. The second quote from Richard Branson is, when I was a kid, I had a tendency to criticise. But when I did, my mum would whisk me off into the bathroom and stand me in front of the mirror. Ten minutes, never less, to think about how criticism is a poor reflection on the one who criticises. That's an interesting way of looking at things, isn't it? You'll find successful people don't criticise others. They don't make fun of others. They actually like to hear when other people are successful. They appreciate it when other people are successful. Having an abundant mindset, knowing that somebody else having a successful property deal or successful business doesn't stop them from having one. So rather than criticise others, you don't know what's going on there. What my suggestion is, is be supportive of others. The third quote from Richard Branson today is, too many people measure how successful they are by how much money they make 
or by the people they associate with. He said, in my opinion, true success should be measured by how happy you are. And that's true, because we all know people who've got lots of money, but are miserable. We also know people who don't have as much money as some, and yet are happy in their life. So in my mind, money's important in those areas where it's important, but not at all important in areas where it's not important. So to be truly wealthy in life, you have to be grateful. You've got to appreciate what you've got. I know every morning before I get out of bed, I think of three things that I'm grateful for, and it makes me feel better for the day. And the last quote today from Richard Branson is, fun is one of the most important and underrated ingredients in any successful venture. If you're not having fun, then it's probably time to call it quits and try something else. Interestingly, when my kids asked me what should they do in life when they grow up, I said they should find something that they enjoy and have fun. Fun is an important part of life. Again, if you don't appreciate it, if you don't enjoy the journey, you're not going to enjoy the destination. Well, there's some great quotes from Richard Branson. You can't drive a Lamborghini with the engine of a Hyundai. If you want to have the success of people like Richard Branson, you've got to think like the rich. You've got to change your wealth operating system. You've got to increase your mindset. And that's why we discuss this every week on the Michael Yartney podcast. If you're enjoying our show, please subscribe on iTunes. You'll find us there as Michael Yardney Podcast, and we'd really appreciate it if you would leave us a review. When you do, we'll read it out on the show. By the way, Michael creates a lot of content he only sends out by email, which you can have with no obligation. So also visit michaelyardneypodcast.com and subscribe to his commentary there. Now, one more question we're going to answer in this Michael Yardney podcast, and it's a great one from David Sutton from Wyoming in New South Wales. I didn't even know there was a Wyoming in Australia. All I can think of is the United States. But his question is, I think there are a number of ways to become a successful property investor, including positive cash flow. Can you comment on the pros and cons of a cash flow positive strategy, and if it's even if it's not your preferred strategy? Okay, David, I will comment on it. And you're right, it's not my preferred strategy. I've been investing for over 40 years now, and uh, my team at Metropole have dealt with thousands and thousands of property investors. We've been involved in over $2 billion worth of property transactions. And I have never, ever, ever seen anybody become financially free buying cash flow positive properties. Let me explain. That doesn't mean that you don't need cash flow. You do. The end game is cash flow. But to become financially free through property, there are three stages of your investment career. In my mind, residential real estate is a high growth, relatively low yield property investment. So don't try and bastardize it by making it a cash flow investment. In my mind, your job should be to step one, build your asset base. Then step two of a 15, 20 year investment career is to slowly lower your loan to value ratios. And then the third step is to live off your property portfolio, whether it's my preferred strategy of living off your equity or any other strategy. But the job, the only way you can become financially free through property is building an asset base so that one day you don't have to work because your money is going to work for you. Now, I know when it comes to property investment, you're going to hear two conflicting philosophies around. Sure, there are people who are pandering to those who can't afford and who can't save, and they're suggesting you should invest in a property that's cash flow positive because it's got the capacity to earn more income, to generate, I guess I should say, more income uh, than the expenses. Uh, And then, of course, there's the capital growth crew who are suggesting that you should be buying high growth properties. Now, there's no argument that there are cash flow positive properties around. The trouble is to become a successful property investor, your job is going to have to be to duplicate your activities. In other words, to buy another property and another property and build your asset base. The thing is that most people's incomes means they're only ever going to have the capacity to invest in one property at a time. In in these days, you can't invest without a deposit anymore and it's getting harder to save that deposit. So the key to growing your portfolio through duplication 
means you're going to have to get more deposits, which means you're going to have to grow your wealth. The capital growth is going to get you the next deposit. And interestingly, as the property increases in value, so does the rents. And five or 10 years down the track, your capital growth, high growth property is going to deliver more cash flow than the lower growing high cash flow property. Because after a while, even though it goes up in value, it won't go up in value anywhere near as much and the rents won't go up as much. The other issue is when things go wrong, those cash flow positive properties are not going to be as liquid. They're going to generally be in secondary locations. And I'm not talking about terrible locations like mining towns. I'm even talking about regional locations or sub-regional locations which fluctuate in value more. And so your aim is to only buy investment grade properties. And in my mind, having more equity by having high growth properties, you're going to have more choices and more opportunities. I didn't really answer your question properly, did I? I didn't really answer what are the pros of cash flow positive properties. And I guess the pros are that you don't need as much of your surplus income to be able to hold on to the property. The cons are you're not going to get to the next level. So how do you hold on to a high growth property if you don't have much surplus income? First of all, you either buy a cheaper property, there won't be as much negative cash flow, or you have a cash flow buffer borrowing equity to service the debt. Now, I've discussed this in great detail in my books and in previous podcasts, so I'm not going to go into that here. But there is a trick. You can't turn a cash flow positive property into a high growth property because of its geographic location. But you can achieve both high returns cash flow and capital growth by renovating or developing your high growth properties. That way you're going to get higher rent, extra depreciation allowances, and that'll convert a high growth, relatively low cash flow property into a strong cash flow property that's going to give you the best of both worlds. Thanks for your question because I allowed me, I guess, to rant a bit about why I can't even see a reasonable answer to buy a cash flow positive property. Thanks for spending the last 20 minutes with me. And in particular, thank you to all of you who've been sending in the questions. I can't answer them all at once, but there are so many great questions. I'm going to have more of these Q&A days in the future. So I look forward to catching up with you this time next week for my regular weekly show about how to become more successful, not just in property, but in all elements of your life. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect, and pass on their wealth through strategic property advice. If you got value from listening to this podcast, please leave us a review and we'll read it out on a future show. Just go to michaelyardneypodcast.com forward slash review, and it will take you over to iTunes where you can enter a review and let us know what you think. We'd really appreciate it. If you don't already subscribe on iTunes or on your Android phone, you'll find us there as Michael Yardney Podcast. If you'd like to gain instant access to the show notes or a transcript of the show, head across to michaelyardneypodcast.com. Watch out for our show next week. you learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 20 minutes.